I hate this story. I hate it. After the Christmas story, you're all full, full of the warm and fuzzies, right? <laughs> I mean, I, I love the story of how the angel Gabriel comes to Mary, says, you're going to be a mother. She goes, how can this be? Nothing is impossible with God. And Joseph, oh, what, what faith and trust that Joseph had to take Mary as his wife, care for her, even though he had no relations with her until the birth of the Savior. I love the story of Mary on a donkey <laughs> to Bethlehem, eight and a half months, nine months pregnant. That couldn't have been fun, but they made it. And sure, it must have been tough to get there and not have any room, but hey, they found a spot and she gave birth to a Savior. And there's the oxen and the sheep and the little land that snuggles next to Jesus. I love that story. And then the angels. Oh, the angels appear to the shepherds who are watching over their flocks and says, Peace to the world. Goodwill to men. And then the whole company of angels singing. And so then the shepherds hurry off and they find Mary and Joseph and they worship the Savior. And they go off and tell everyone the Savior has been born. I love that story. I love it. And then the Magi. Oh, the Magi from the east follow the star to where Mary and Joseph and the new king is born. So they got to Bethlehem and they asked the king, King Herod, Where's this baby, this new king that is born? We followed his star, and we've come to worship him. Herod didn't like that. Um, for lack of a better way of saying it, Herod was insane. He was crazy. He was known for murdering groups of people at a time who would, anyone, families, children, his own children, anyone who would threaten his throne. And so he put on a good face, and he told the Magi, uh, according to my scholars, you'll be born in Bethlehem. Go and make a careful search for the child. And once you find him, report back to me, so that I too can worship him. This is where I hate the story. And this is our gospel for today. The Magi found the child. They gave him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And then verse 13. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, he took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod, and so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. The Magi didn't go back, they were revealed, it was revealed to them by an angel to go another route. When he was outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children, but refusing to be comforted, because they are no more. After Herod died, the angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he had heard that Archelaus 
was reigning in Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, that he would be called a Nazarene. I hate this story, especially having a two-year-old son. But I love the message. And that's what I'm going to share with you this morning. Answering three questions. Question number one, why did Matthew record this account? A Matthew was a tax collector. Now, he was a Jew. And his specific gospel or life of Jesus uh, you can tell that it was written to Jewish people. There's a lot of Old Testament references um, and, and looking back to prophecies, and he's showing in his gospel that Jesus is the promised Messiah uh, here to save both Jew and Gentile. And so in Matthew's gospel, um, you can see he's proving to them that Jesus is the Messiah, and he does just that with this account. Because if you would have asked one Jewish person, and said, where's the Messiah going to come from? He would say, well, uh, according to Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, out of Egypt I called my son. Therefore, the Messiah will come from Egypt. But if you ask the Jewish person sitting next to them, they would say, no, 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 that's not right. According to Micah chapter 5, verse 2, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel. So the Savior, the Messiah, will come from Bethlehem. And then the third Jewish person sitting there saying, no, 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 they're all wrong. Um, it, it says in the Old Testament that he will be a Nazarene from Nazareth. And so which one is it? You can understand why there would be disagreement, but in this chaotic situation, look at what God is doing. Was Jesus born in Bethlehem? Yes. Did he come from Egypt? Yes. Was he a Nazarene? Yes. And so you have to wonder, why would God allow all of this craziness to happen, this chaos to happen in the life of the Savior, but you realize that God is in control of the chaos? What did it say in Galatians chapter 4? But when the set time had fully come, God sent his Son. See, God is in control in all of this because he had to be born in Bethlehem. He had to come from Egypt. He had to be a Nazarene in order to fill all, fulfill all of the prophecies. If any of one of those prophecies doesn't come true, then God is a liar. And so to us, it may seem chaotic and out of control, and you may hate the story, but we love the message. Because here in this story, we see that God was in control the whole time to fulfill the Old Testament prophecies. And you might be thinking, yeah, okay, that's nice. But there is one question that I can't get over, and it's that question that makes me hate this story. Why? Why, God, would you let this happen to those little babies? I hated studying this. I did not enjoy it. I came home sad. My wife said, what's wrong? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> just don't like it. Why would God let this horrible thing happen to these little babies? Um, how many were there? We don't know. There's probably 2,000, 3,000 people in Bethlehem. So maybe 10, 20 surrounding areas, not too many more. But still... What did those little babies do? Couldn't God have come up with some other way? Why would God let such evil happen in this world? But this isn't the only time that we ask that question, right? I mean, that's a question that we've asked throughout the Bible. There in the beginning, Genesis chapter 3, the serpent comes into the paradise and tempts Adam and Eve to fall into sin. Why didn't God just stop it? Why would God let evil happen in this world? Think about in uh, the story of the Israelites and Moses. Moses was put into a cute little boat and floated down the river. Aw, oh, isn't that cute? But remember why? 
It's because Pharaoh had all the babies thrown into the Nile. You go, God, why would you let this evil happen? Or Job? I mean, we get a behind-the-scenes video of what's happening, and Satan's coming up to God and saying, what about that Job? God says, yeah, just can't take his life. Why would God let such evil happen in this world? Why would God let these little babies be killed? And then we have to step back and remember that we're not God. We, we look through our own eyes and we see the little story, the little, what we can understand what's going on. But we have to remember that God is in control. And there's two things we have to remember. God does not ordain evil. What does that mean? God doesn't create evil. He doesn't institute it. But God uses evil for his good. This is an evil world. And there is an evil devil who hates us. But God is in control and he uses the evil as his instrument for our good. So for like the, the babies, the little babies in this story, how could God use this for their good? Martin Luther gives an interesting description. I figured, might as well just quote him, right? See what you think of this. By their circumstance, that's the little babies who were killed by Herod, they had been received into the covenant of grace by God. And in their innocence, they died, in that they had a twofold advantage. They, had they lived, they would have committed actual sin. But now their death serves them to give them a better life. Secondly, they had the advantage to die for Christ's sake. And their death was not a punishment for sin, but an obedience pleasing to God and a highly blessed work. Um, what did Luther mean by that? These babies, most likely, odds are that they were circumcised, which means they were connected into God's promise of being their children. And having that promise when they died, they would be in heaven. Now, in order to justify or maybe say, maybe look at it from God's perspective, we can't guarantee, we can't play God. We don't know the mind of God. But what Martin Luther is saying is, these, these little babies, who knows? We don't know all the possibilities. Maybe they grow up and they reject God. But being in the covenant of the promise, having the promises of God, God took them from this life of evil and hurt and brought them into heaven. So to us, in our perspective, in our minds, if we would play God, it looks terrible and we hate this story. But ask those babies when you get to heaven if they hate the story. Sometimes it seems like things are chaos. But God is in control. We trust and we hold on to those promises of God that he does not ordain evil, but he does use it for an instrument for his good. And he is our good God. What did Jesus say in John chapter 16? He said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus came into this world to save us. And, and that's where we see that in this world of evil and sin and chaos, we can trust that God is still in control. Um, there's a great example from the Old Testament. Isn't it interesting, or looking at verses 17 and 18, can we go back to that actually? Uh, slides and get to verse 17 and 18. Yeah, right at uh, kind of like the last two lines where it's the, the fulfilled prophecy. What did it say? A voice is heard in Rama, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. 
So with the crying mothers of these dead babies, Matthew is saying the prophecy of Jeremiah is fulfilled. What is that prophecy? Well, Rachel, anyone, you guys remember who Rachel was? Rachel, Jacob's wife, mother of Joseph and Benjamin. Benjamin. Did anything bad happen to Joseph and Benjamin that Rachel cried over? No, she died giving birth to Benjamin. So what is it talking about here? It's talking about Rachel's descendants. Uh, the tribe of Benjamin was in the southern kingdom of Israel. And I'm going to make a long Israelite history very short for you. There's civil war. Ten tribes up in the north, two tribes down in the south. One of those is Benjamin. So for the tribes, the, the kingdom of southern Judah, another name for that is Benjamin. The southern kingdom of, Benjamin, of, of Judah, they were God's chosen people. They had Jerusalem. They had the temple. They had the presence of God there with them. But then an evil empire in Babylon came down, destroyed the temple, destroyed Jerusalem. And they took the people of God, the descendants of Rachel. They ripped them away. And do you want to know where they gathered before they started their exile? And their trip to Babylon? I'll give you one guess. It starts with an R. Rama. See what it's saying here? As, as the Israelites were ripped away from the promised land and ripped away from the temple and the presence of God, and there was weeping and mourning because they are no more. They were taken away from God's promised land. But what did God do for the people of Benjamin, for the people of Judah? He brought them back. He restored them. Through all of this, he was in control. Though to them, at that moment, there was weeping and crying and mourning because they were being ripped away. God used that evil as his instrument for good to restore them, to bring about the Savior. And he does the same for us, which is really the third question we have for today. Why is it okay for me to hate the story but love the message? Because God's in control. Can I read again what we read for Isaiah, our first reading today? Um, this was written before the kingdom of Judah was taken away. And yet, Isaiah was prophesying that it would happen. At the end of his book, this is what he says. I will tell of the kindness of the Lord, the deeds for which he is to be praised according to all that the Lord has done for us. Yes, the many good things, even though you're going to be ripped away, he has done for Israel according to his compassion and many kindnesses. He said, surely they are my people, children who will be true to me, and I. So he became their savior. In all their distress, he too was distressed. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his mercy, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. God does not send evil on us. He uses it. For his good. We live in an evil world and we are going to suffer and it's not going to be fun. We're going to suffer distress. But the message of God throughout the Bible is that he has saved us. He is in control. I think if you have studied Revelation, Revelation is dripping with this message. It's full of fancy, just amazing, beautiful imagery of Horrible enemies against God's church, whether it's famine or, or death or sickness and the devil and the dragon, they're all coming. These locusts that are the size of horses with like flames coming out of their mouths, they're all coming to do damage to God's church and God's people. And then the land, the Lion of Judah, he wins. <laughs> like that's it. And it's victorious and it's glorious and we'll be in heaven 
What, is that, what does that mean for us? Life is going to be tough. I guarantee it. If you haven't felt it already, <laughs> you will. You are going to suffer and you're going to wonder, where is God in all of this? But God is in control because look at what he has already done for you. He put himself in the middle of the chaos. I mean, the story of Christmas is not a pretty story. We love it, but it's not pretty. I mean, God was born in a stable. None of us had to go through that. And before he's one, maybe one and a half years old, he has to run for his life. None of us have had to go through that, I don't think. He moved to Egypt and never went back to Bethlehem and up to Nazareth. And then he grows up. Life doesn't get any better for him. His cousin gets beheaded. His friends die. He knows the thoughts of everyone around him. He knows that he is there as these people's savior and they reject him. He suffers hunger. He suffers sadness. He suffers being tired, exhausted. He suffers the cross. He suffers being whipped and beaten and mocked and having a crown of thorns put on him. Though he is God, he suffers death. give us life. God went through all of that chaos to give you the guarantee of heaven. And we see that here in this story, this history. And isn't that our takeaway today? I so badly wish as your friend and as your pastor, that I could promise you from God's word that you will never suffer hurt or pain or, or the kind of distress that these poor mothers had to go through. But I can't promise you that. I can't. In fact, I can promise you that you're going to suffer. But here's what I can promise you. God does not ordain evil uses it as his instrument for his good. I can promise you that God will work out all things for your good. You can trust in him. Because in the chaos, he is in control. In the chaos and the hurt, you can always know that you have heaven. Amen.